Hello writers, how are you? I hope you are great. Welcome to Story Kitchen. I'm Jane and today I want to talk about setting as an ingredient in your story. Before we get started, I have an announcement to make about Story Kitchen and we have new classes that are going to be posted very soon. If you subscribe to our newsletter, then you get discounts on all of our classes and we do also offer scholarships. So please inquire about those. We have a class on flash fiction writing. We have a class on prose lessons from screenwriting, which is taught by Maureen. I'm going to teach the flash fiction one because I love flash fiction and I think it's great and more people should do it and Maureen and I are jointly going to teach a game and narrative design class which is going to be a four-week workshop intensive and those are all coming in the first quarter of 2022 which is super exciting so if you want to find out more sign up for the newsletter and that'll also give you a promo code for our classes all right back to setting I asked my sister a little while ago what she thought about setting and how she approaches setting. She's also a writer and she told me that for her setting is linked to voice, that it can't exist without voice. So once she has a sense of the voice of the story, then that informs her setting. And I thought this was really interesting and it's not something that I would have articulated in quite that way, but I think I know what she means. In fact, what she said about setting and voice being linked reminds me a lot of what Carmen Maria Machado said in her memoir, In the Dream House, where let me find the quote. Places are never just places in a piece of writing. If they are, the author has failed. Setting is not inert. It is activated by point of view. And I feel like that's what my sister was getting at, or that's her way of expressing what Carmen Maria Machado is saying is point of view. Because point of view, of course, as we talked about in the video on point of view, is very much about voice. So I want to get into that and I want to consider seven aspects of setting that make it a really fascinating ingredient to work with in your fiction. But first, before we get into that, I want to back up a little bit and talk about the difference between setting and world building. Because I think there's overlap, but I think of them as two different things. World building is, for me, the foundation of your setting. It's the how and the why. It's the mechanics behind the surface that explain why the elements on the surface exist. It's like the engine under the hood of the car or the engineering inside the clock. You get the idea. The world building drives your setting details, but the setting is about what you choose to show to the reader and why. What are the elements of the world that your characters interact with or that your POV lights up for the reader to understand? Whether or not that's underpinned by deeply thought out logical world building or whether you're doing it kind of intuitively Intuitively, intuitively, I think that's the primary difference. World building is the why and setting is the what. Does that make sense? But of course, even though we've differentiated setting and world building, I still think setting is very broad and a very flexible idea because it can include obviously physical location. And I say obviously because that's, I think, what most people, including myself, think of immediately when we think setting, we think, where is this set? But it can also include things like time period. It can include micro things like there's a larger setting of, let's say, a continent, but then there's the specific setting of someone's home, right? Or there's the larger setting of, oh, this takes place in the autumn of 1908. And then there's the micro setting detail of at the scene takes place at seven in the morning. In 1908. Another thing to remember, and I know this is obvious, but I'm just laying it out there so we all are on the same page as far as setting, is that even though we typically think of setting as a singular thing, we'll say, where's the story set? What's the setting of the story? Usually that setting includes several different settings. A story may move through different time periods and it definitely moves through different times of day and definitely different locations as well. 
One tip that I have for you is if you're finding that your story feels kind of um, static and kludgy, one thing to possibly look at is are you changing up the setting or have you set everything in the same place? You might be going for that claustrophobic one act play everything in the same space sort of feeling which I think can work really well for a short story or for a horror story. But if you're not going for that, then just looking at the variety of settings that you have and the contrast between them can be a way to diagnose some issues with your story if you feel like it is kind of not going anywhere fast enough. Bowie, you wanna come sit on my lap? My poor dog has strained his neck. Just something that he does sometimes because he's old. So he's on painkillers right now and kind of wandering around my office. Poor buddy. You just relax there, okay? Now that we have that covered, I want to move on to the eight different ways to think about your setting in a story. I'm gonna be pulling from examples of older books and there will be maybe some spoilers. I'm especially drawing from the book Jane Eyre, which is a fantastic book. I love this book. If you haven't read Jane Eyre and don't wanna be spoiled, then you might want to skip parts of this, but you have been warned and Jane Eyre has been out for a long time with several movies, so I don't feel too bad about spoiling it. I will be talking about other books as well, but in general, I'm not giving away core plot points. I'm really more talking about setting and how they impact our feelings. The first, and I think for most of us, the most immediate impact that setting provides in a story is that it delivers atmosphere or mood. And this is especially important, I think, in the opening pages of a story or a novel. I do like to understand a little bit about where and when we are from the very beginning because I believe that it helps situate the reader. Of course, not all novels do this and there are brilliant exceptions to, to any of these rules of thumb. But in general, you want to think about orienting the reader and giving them some handhold so they can start making some assumptions about the story, which then you can subvert or reinforce as you wish. So while you're doing that, setting is an orientation, but you're also delivering atmosphere and mood. And to me, that plays into the idea of setting genre expectations. So if I'm writing a gothic ghost story, the atmosphere and the mood that I want to set at the very beginning is either going to say to my readers, hey, this is going to be a gloomy, dark, gothic, slightly creepy story. Buckle in for that kind of, that kind of mood, those kinds of vibes. Or... Conversely, I can try to play up the contrast by maybe starting off with a sunny, beautiful, happy, cheerful picnic scene on the grass, the most sort of ungothic thing that I can think of, and then sort of twist it halfway through the scene if I wanted. And that could also be effective. So think about the atmosphere that the setting provides. That is going to help you choose which setting details and how you describe those details. By the way, this video is not really about how to write settings. It's really more like, let's study the impacts of settings in stories so you can better understand how awesome and powerful this ingredient is. Number two, setting can deliver symbolism. I'm thinking, for example, of the sequence in the Fellowship of the Ring series when they have to go to the Mines of Moria. That is a very symbolically rich and evocative scene and the setting as well, because the setting is a place that has become a literal graveyard. It's like they're descending into the underworld and it's appropriate. It is a time that tests many of the characters. And in fact, for at least one character, they experience a symbolic death. They also dredge up a monster from the deep who is very much a sort of devil hell creature. It's a creature of flame and malice. And the whole imagery around this setting, the Mines of Moria, is that this once great dwarven empire has fallen. It is now in ruins and decay, and it very much resembles an underworld. It also happens fairly early in the trilogy, 
especially if you view it as a trilogy. And I think it functions as some sort of foreshadowing as well. So I think the Mines of Moria are a great example of a large space that can have symbolic import. But I also want to talk about elements in setting that you can use and you can build up symbols over time. And for this, I'm going to turn to Jane Eyre. Those people who have loved Jane Eyre will probably remember the significance of the old chestnut tree that stands on Thornhill. So Jane Eyre has come to Thornhill, this once grand house, uh, to work as a governess. And on the house grounds, there is this beautiful chestnut tree. And we first encounter it, I believe in spring when it is flowering and gorgeous. Let me read that little snippet for you because it's really a wonderful passage. No nook in the grounds more sheltered and more Eden-like. It was full of trees. It bloomed with flowers. A very high wall shut it out from the court on one side. On the other, a beach avenue screened it from the lawn. At the bottom was a sunk fence, its sole separation from lonely fields, a winding walk bordered with laurels and terminating in a giant horse chestnut, circled at the base by a seat, led down to the fence. Here, one could wander unseen. While such honeydew fell, such silence reigned, such gloaming gathered. I felt as if I could haunt such shade forever. But in threading the flower and fruit parterres at the upper part of the enclosure, enticed there by the light the now rising moon cast on this more open quarter, my step is stayed, not by sound, not by sight, but once more by warning fragrance. So she's in this Eden-like gorgeous garden with this beautiful horse chestnut amid laurels and flowers and Mr. Rochester, her employer and the object of her interest arrives and actually he proposes to her at the base of this chestnut tree. And they have this long conversation where he's wooing her in his way. And then there is a storm in the distance, but joy soon effaced every other feeling. And loud as the wind blew, near and deep as the thunder crashed, fierce and frequent as the lightning gleamed, cataract-like as the rain fell during a storm of two hours duration, I experienced no fear and little awe. Mr. Rochester came thrice to my door in the course of it to ask if I was safe and tranquil. And that was comfort. That was strength for anything. Before I left my bed in the morning, little Adele, that's the little girl that she is teaching, came running in to tell me that the great horse chestnut at the bottom of the orchard had been struck by lightning in the night and half of it split away. So this is a masterful use of symbolism in the setting. This gorgeous horse chestnut, which before was the epitome of spring and bloom and love and was the site of this proposal and this union that they pledged to each other, is now broken in half by a strike of lightning. Yes, it is a sign. It is an ominous sign. Jane Eyre definitely interprets it as an ominous sign. Another thing that setting can do really well is setting can deliver theme. One of the themes in Jane Eyre is that she is searching for love. She wants to be accepted and loved for who she is, but without sacrificing any of herself to get it. So she doesn't want to change herself or hide herself or become someone that she's not. And she feels throughout that she deserves love for herself. It's an awesome theme for this novel, I think. And the settings that she traverses throughout the novel each test her idea of what love is and each offer a kind of love that for one reason or another, she either accepts or rejects. For example, in the very first setting, we are in the house of the Reeds and Mrs. Reed is her foster caretaker. Mrs. Reed is extremely not happy to have Jane Eyre as a ward and treats her very poorly. And Jane finds herself having to stand up for herself and rebel against the Reeds. And the house is essentially a prison for her. It is a mockery of the family love and acceptance that Jane deserves and that Jane should have. But instead, this site of 
what ought to be domestic shelter and safety is turned into a prison. And then it is exemplified in one scene when Jane, for a punishment, is locked up into a room that she calls the Red Room, which has a supernatural aura to it for Jane, who's like eight years old in this scene or maybe even younger, but she's just a kid and she's scared of the Red Room because that is a room where someone has died and she believes it to be haunted and she has a very upsetting experience in it. So there's a wonderful example in my mind of how a setting can play into a theme and suggest that this is this kind of love is actually a, a trap. It's a prison. So settings in Jane Eyre, I think, really reinforce themes in that way. I want to pull out another example about theme and setting because settings can also literalize your theme. And that's what Suzanne Collin does in The Hunger Games. And I know everyone is maybe sick of hearing about the, the Hunger Games, but I can't help it. A, most people know that book or seen the movie and B, Suzanne Collins does do some things really well. And one of the things is that she builds a setting that is a literal interpretation of what the theme is. And one of the themes of the Hunger Games is how those in power have control over the disenfranchised and impoverished people of this world. And they do so literally by creating these districts where the central district has all the power and all the wealth and the outlying districts are under the control of the central district and have to provide taxes and resources and it turns out sacrifices. Okay, what number are we on? Number four. Setting, especially as activated by POV, can deliver character. One of the writing exercises that you probably know about, and if you don't, it's a great one to try to do, is to write the same scene and write the same sitting from the p setting from the POV of two very different characters in it. What are the things they notice? What are the things they respond to? How do they feel about the things that they notice? Again, to pull an example from Jane Eyre, we can go back to that first house that she was living in versus Thornhill, where she lives in a little bit later as an adult. In the first house with the reeds, as I mentioned before, the house is a prison. We're given to understand through some of the details that she shares that this house is actually quite a wealthy, grand house. And it's probably a really comfortable house for the reeds themselves and especially for Mrs. Reed. It probably has really lovely furniture and has big, tall Georgian windows and beautiful gardens and so on. But because Jane is not free and she is disregarded and dismissed and unloved, we get a very different feeling about the house through Jane's description. And Jane doesn't really appreciate all the architectural details and the luxury because to her, the house is a prison and she doesn't want to be there. Number five, setting is a great ingredient for revealing character change and growth as well as setting change. Wait, no, as well as story change, right? The setting could actually be the record of events and consequences of events that happen in your story. They can be revealed in setting details. For example, in Jane Eyre, because of the events of the story and in specifically Mr. Rochester's actions, in my opinion, Mr. Rochester is definitely part of this. Um, uh, Thornhill at the end of the book is a very different Thornhill than it was at the beginning of the book. And when Jane comes back, she finds it very different. Her feelings about it also have changed a little bit. It is a familiar place to her and therefore she is very eager to get back to find Mr. Rochester again at the very end of that story. Other ways that you can show character growth, uh, the classic one is of course when somebody visits a place as a young person, a child perhaps, and then when they visit it again later, they find that this place that they thought used to be so big and so grand is actually 
in, you know, they're informed by their adult experiences and their adult perspectives, and they see it in a very different light. A setting is a great vehicle for cluing the reader into some interesting character changes that you want to include in your story. And you can do it in very subtle ways. You actually don't even have to have the character go, oh, wow, this place looks really different from what I remember. You could do it just simply by the way that they interact with the setting in a different way. And readers may not 100% pick up on it consciously, but I, I guarantee you that a lot of readers are going to pick up on it subconsciously. And some will definitely see it as a conscious thing. Number six, setting can reinforce tropes and genre conventions or contradict them for fresh new twists. For example, in the gothic genre, there's a lot of settings that are gloomy. We've got cloudy skies. They're typically set in a cold spring or winter or fall. There's a big, gloomy, often Victorian house that seems slightly haunted. We're often isolated. And you can play with those conventions for sure. And that's what I'm doing in my Gothic ghost story is that I am leaning into a lot of those archetypes of what makes a Gothic setting a Gothic setting. But I could also see a story that does the opposite of this and contrasts a setting detail or set of details with the genre. And one way, for example, you could do this is maybe instead of setting it in a gothic mansion, you set it in a modern hospital, but it's still a gothic story. Maybe it's a modern hospital in Los Angeles with a lot of sunshine, and yet you use the same creepy vibes and the same sense of isolation and the same sense of, oh my gosh, I can't really trust my own perceptions, what's happening, those kinds of other things that we associate with a lot of gothic literature, not only to deliver a fresh take on what gothic is, but also to catch the reader unawares a little bit. Because if you open with this bright, modern, clinical setting, A, the reader can be expecting something that you can then subvert and surprise them. B, the other thing you can do is that by using the setting, you can interrogate what in that setting actually justifies the gothicness of it, right? So if you set it in this bright, clean, modern, sanitized hospital, and yet you still have a gothic story that's all about isolation and a little bit terror and discomfort, then basically what you're saying is that, look, even this setting is prone to having these reactions among the people who have to deal with it. Or there is a way in which this sanitized clinical setting can also be a as much of a prison and as 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 hostile to the humans who have to live there. Which, you know, if you're writing a story that takes on themes of the healthcare system, for example, would be a really great way to highlight the ways in which our modern clinical efficient healthcare system is actually toxic. Number seven, setting can provide plot. Your setting can offer obstacles for your protagonist to overcome or opportunities to let them progress through your story. For example, you can throw your characters, as I so often do, into a prison and there the setting becomes a problem for them to solve an obstacle. They have to try to figure out a way out of the prison, but there may be setting details in the prison which can empower your characters to bust out if indeed bust out is what you want them to do. And finally, number eight. The other thing that setting can do is it creates an immersive experience for the reader. It contributes to what John Gardner calls the fictive dream. He had this idea that really there are no rules in writing except that the reader wants to enter into your world and stay there. They want to be in the fictive dream and have it sustained for as long as possible without getting pulled out of it. And that is the real pleasure of reading. And I think there's something to that. I often think about about immersion when I write and setting definitely plays a role in that. When your setting has these elements that readers can really sink into, they can really feel grounded in the world, the, that world is really being strongly evoked to them, vividly evoked to them. They're traversing this world smoothly through the POV of your POV character or an omniscient POV if you're using that. 
then readers tend to stay engaged and inside your story world longer. So I think setting is a really key ingredient in delivering that kind of immersion. Okay, I think that's everything. I've talked a lot and I will end it there, but I want to leave you with an exercise. If you are curious about how setting is working in your current work in progress, then take a scene from something that you're currently working on. Reread that scene and ask yourself the following questions. What tone or mood does the setting convey? Is that the tone or mood that you want the scene to have? Two, how does the POV character in the scene feel about the setting details? And is that the feeling that you want them to have? How does the POV character and other characters, if there are other characters, interact with the setting? Four, are there details about the setting that you think could enhance any of the feelings that you're trying to evoke? Five, is there something unique either in the setting details or in your description of the setting details? Some way of thinking about an element that you haven't seen much before or some way that the POV character thinks of or reacts to the setting that you think is unique? And if your answer is no, what could be that detail or description or interaction that would be unique? And finally, six, does your character's relationship with the setting change over the course of the scene? If not, should it change? Okay, once you've answered those questions, try rewriting your scene with those questions in mind and see if you discover something that enhances the setting and how it works in your scene. That is all I have for you today. Thank you and happy writing.